Well, again, we want to greet you tonight in Jesus' name and welcome all of you to this service. It's been a joy to be with you this week. It seems like the time is rapidly passing. It might be just appropriate tonight for me to express on behalf of Suzanne and myself our thanks to you for your kindnesses to us through the week. We have a beautiful place to stay. We've been invited to several of your homes. And though we've enjoyed those meals and that fellowship was very rich today again, we also have appreciated those who have come to visit us there at the house where we are. And your lives are very important to God and to all of us. We appreciate the opportunity we've had to uh, visit with you. There's probably still a little more time. We can still do that some more if there's that opportunity. So the theme up here, there's a verse about revival on this wall behind me, and maybe it's too early to tell, but I guess you have learned by this time that it's impossible for there to be a revival at Ozark without someone's life being changed. In other words, if we stay the same as we were, there'll be no revival then. There must be a change come if there's going to be a difference. that that people may rejoice in thee. Now, I don't know if you want God to change you in any way or not, or if you feel a need for that. If you're aware of any area of life where maybe a change would be good for you, for your family, for your marriage relationship, for whatever, but there's no revival without a change. And, and remember something, the, the, the change should be evident, the change should be working in the preacher's life too. I heard something today that was very beautiful. Somebody must have been singing this song that we have sung several times this week, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. And uh, saying that and evidently sent it out to some friends or something and I uh, happened to be at a place where I could hear that recording, beautiful voice singing this hymn. And I think we will sing the four stanzas of it tonight. We haven't done that for a while. And so uh, I wonder if it's okay if we would stand to sing this hymn. And then when, when you're finished singing the fourth stanza, I mean, that's for those that can. If, if my wife would be here, she would not be standing. She can't stand. So for some of you, it might not be appropriate to stand. That's okay if you don't. But after the fourth stanza, those, again, that can, if you'd like to remain standing for, for prayer. And then we'll uh, get into this message for tonight. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. In light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. Thy great name we praise. On resting, on feasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice, like mountains, high soaring above. Thy Goodness and love to all life thou givest to both great and small. In all life thou livest the true.
and wither and perish, but not change at Father, tonight we have words to share tonight that have come from your word and are very important words, and this precious congregation needs to understand these words, and we don't have the capacity we ought to have to express something that's so deep, so beautiful, so pertinent, so indicative, so necessary to live this Christian life that brings revival to all men. Oh God, if we could have a revival in this area, if we could experience a change in our hearts here, it would change everything about us. It would change everything that people know of us. It would empower us, oh God. It would give us a testimony to light that the world is longing to see. I pray that you would prepare us tonight. I pray that you would give us a hunger tonight. I pray that you would move among us tonight with these thoughts that come so very hard to the, close to the heart of our Lord Jesus. Would you bless us tonight as we worship you together? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now we have been for a few evenings here looking at several themes from First John, these five chapters. I was thinking of bringing another message on this tomorrow night, but I'm not sure if we will. It just seems like maybe something else we ought to do tomorrow night. I'm not sure if we'll be able to do this or not. If we don't have a chance to do that tomorrow night, uh, I would say that what we hear tonight would come as close to capturing the heart of these verses in 1 John as anything we could probably talk about. And though we have referred to this briefly on previous evenings, we want to focus on it especially tonight. When I preach, I, I take two things for granted. Now, if this is not true of anyone here, then I'm sorry, but, but you will come to understand that this is the basis with which I'm speaking to you. The first thing that I assume is that if you're a Christian here tonight, you truly want to understand. You, you are sincere about what's in God's word and you know that God's word is foundational for whatever we do in life and how we live. And you're, you're sincere about it. And you, 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 you do want to hear it and you do want to understand it. I, I, I assume that, I take that for granted. If that's not the way it is, if that sincerity is not there, if that desire is not there, yeah, I'm sure it makes, it makes a pretty long service to have to sit through it. The second thing I assume is that if you're sitting here and maybe you're a seeker, maybe you are someone that has not been acquainted with Christian experience and life and teaching and community,
Maybe you're not a Christian. I, I assume that your presence here means that you'd be glad for someone to explain it to you. You'd be glad to understand it. You'd be glad to have a chance to hear something, hear of a truth, hear of a teaching that was maybe not clear to you before. You didn't know about it. You didn't have an opportunity to hear it. So you didn't know how to do it. You didn't, weren't planning to live it because you didn't know about it. I was preaching in the state of Tennessee one evening. Says, this was done in our congregation. It was about an hour away from where we live. And it was, it was a, kind of a strange thing. It was a Sunday night. And they'd asked me to speak there. And I decided I would try to answer a question that I knew that somebody in that congregation had. So the question was, how do we know that in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 15, how do we know that the veiling spoken of there, the covering spoken of in that passage is, is the long hair of a woman. Maybe it's the, it says there her, her hair is given her for covering. It, doesn't that mean that if she has long hair, uncut hair, that that is her veiling? So I decided I would spend that Sunday evening church service trying to answer that question. And uh, the, so I prepared thoughts for that. I got to the church service, just about ready to begin the service, and I, I, the door opened in the back, and a very stately couple came into the assembly. It was a couple that normally has not been in that church service before. I don't know if they were ever in that service at that congregation before. They came in there. She was obviously a, a southern belle. She was obviously, a, they were obviously a well-known and wealthy family. She had enough of jewelry on there to, to fill up a jewelry chest, and she uh, was was very finely dressed. Uh, this was his wife, and he was kind of a counterpart to that. And I thought, what are we going to do tonight bringing a subject like this to these visitors in this service? I, I should certainly have chosen something else. We should not have chosen a subject like this. How is this ever going to work with these dear people visiting us in the church service tonight? After the meal, after the service was over, they had a little lunch. They had tables set up. And my wife and I got a tray. We sat down, and this couple came and sat right in front of us, right on the other side of the table. So here's this man, this, here's this lady in front of my wife, and the man's in front of me, and we're sitting there. I thought, how's this going to go? I was feeling three quarters apologetic for what they had listened to that night, and this man began to speak. He said, Preacher, am I ever glad we were here tonight? He said, we know a couple of people from this community. We have some of them for neighbors. And we have seen these ladies with this, what they're wearing on their head. And no one has ever explained to us why they do that. And my wife and I came here tonight, and we heard this teaching. And it sounded so good to us. It sounded so beautiful. I want to thank you for explaining it to us. We never understood that. And we needed to hear that. And so what my fears were completely unfounded. And it was a beautiful thing that that couple had a chance later in life to hear something there. That, that is the assumption with which we speak. And as I speak to you tonight, I have that in mind. That I believe in speaking to sincere people. And, you know, I, I preached in Costa Rica for 34 years. In our little congregation up there in the mountain, and I, this, is, this sounds strange to you. I know this sounds strange to you. We had mostly first-generation Christians in that church. I don't ever recall seeing anyone ever sleep in a church service in our congregation, morning or evening. It's like they're saying, feed us, teach us, tell us, show us. We're waiting to hear. I just share this few thoughts with you as we start tonight. Anyone acquainted with Apostle John knows that his message is this. It's our oneness 
with Christ. It's our union with Christ. It's our fellowship with him. It's our ever abiding in him. John wants us to be like Christ. He believes that we can be like Christ. He believes that the purpose why we're in this earth is to be what Christ was when he was here. This is John. You can't read John without gospel or this message here in 1 John without coming to that conclusion. In the fourth gospel, we find Jesus saying this. You should do as I have done to you. And you read that here several times a year when you have a feet washing service in John 13. You read that where Jesus said, as I have done what you've seen me do, that's what you do. But this, this truth, this teaching from Christ refers to more than washing feet. Yes, he did that and we do that. But as Jesus did, that's what we do. He also said in that same fourth gospel, as my father has sent me, even so send I you, which is John's rendition of the Great Commission. He also said, Ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Which is the Holy Gospel standard for us as Christians. As I have done. That is the, that is the standard with which we live. Let's say this whole thing now in another way. As I have done, Jesus speaking, as you have seen me do, go and do that likewise. It's another way to say it. And there's no higher standard than that. Yet as we, as we have already heard this week, and we've heard it here at Ozark, this whole matter of living this way is not so much a pinnacle, a crest that we have reached, But it's a choice to follow in this most holy and noble of all pursuits. And we don't ever say, I've got there. I've done it now. I've reached it. Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's not saying he's attained it. And so we choose to follow that same example. We press towards it. We're, we're going that direction. We might not be there yet. We might not be where we think we ought to be. We might not be as far as we want to be. But it's a, it's a choice we've made to pursue that course until the prize be won. So you can turn to 1 John there. Maybe you're there already. This is chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 8 again. We've read this verse before. But this verse contains something that we want to look at tonight. something we have not referred to really directly so far. <coughs> this is verse 8 of chapter 2. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. So we've heard that verse before. So I'd like you just maybe to keep your place here in 1 John and go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'd like to read a few other texts that will help prepare us for what John is saying here. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6. I read these verses today. Verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and with all thy might. And now there's not a person in this assembly that will stand up this evening and say that they're doing that. They've reached that. It, it's, a, it's a pursuit. It's a way of life. It's a goal. It's a standard. It is a attainment that we'll spend our lives, lifetimes to get there. And no matter how much we love the Lord, we can love him more. I know and feel I love him, yet I want to love him more, is what we sing in the songbook. With all thine heart, how could I tell that? How could I say that? With all thy soul, with all thy might, so here's a young man with his barbells. 
He's got uh, 125 pounds, 200 pounds on each side of that bar. He's live on a press bench, pushing his barbells up and down in the air, and he's saying, as he does it, I love God with all my might. And I doubt if he's thinking about it. The, the, the might there, the bodybuilding, the muscle development, it's probably for another purpose altogether. Right? Can you, can you handle that? Is that too strong a medicine for you? With all my heart. This, which thing is true in him and in you? Romans chapter 13. That's a New Testament reference. Verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. We can go back a little further to Galatians. This will be chapter 5, just reading one verse here. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now if we go to John's gospel, the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, we can stop in here, stop off at, verse, at chapter 13, I'll read verses 33 through 35. I didn't call this to your attention the other night. But when we were making similarities between the Gospel of John and 1 John, this here is one thing I did not tell you. Look at the first two words in verse 33. You see that? That's, that's John. That's a John expression. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. This is the, what we could call the superlative witness, the ultimate witness to the world. That there, there is no higher way to witness to the world. There is no greater testimony to the world than this. And Jesus says this not only here, he says the same thing in chapter 17 two times when he prays to his father. By this shall all men know. By this he says the world shall know, and back there in the 17th chapter, and by this he says the world shall believe when they see the love we have towards each other in the church. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved. That's the standard. As I have done it. That's the standard here. We find in these verses more than a commandment. It's, it's, it's more than a check it off with your pencil every time you do it. It's something that's never completed that way. It's never done that way. That is not the way this is. First of all, you notice it's called a new commandment. And it's a new commandment in several ways. So tonight I want to call your attention to the genius of this new commandment. The genius of the new commandment. That is what makes it unique, what makes it so powerful, what makes it ultimate. Why is it higher than anything else? Why is it the most important thing? Why does Jesus say that on this hangs all the law and the prophets? Why does Jesus say that no matter what else you do, if you had just this one thing, you would do all the rest of it without even knowing about it? It's the genius it's the highest attainment. Now, John Wesley has been challenged or maligned, or people have said that he has taught some things that he never taught. People say that he believes in supreme perfection. He believes in uh, perfectionism. And he's been taught, he's been, it's been, a, he's been accused of teaching things he did not teach. But I will tell you what John teaches. John Wesley. He says that there is no possible way to reach any higher attainment in Christian experience than to truly love as Christ taught us to love. 
There's no higher thing we can do. There's no greater evidence that Christ is in the heart than when we're loving one another, as Christ has loved us. It's the highest thing we can attain. It's the genius of the new commandment. I want to make four statements about this genius, about this new commandment, this commandment to love, this thing which is true in him and in us, this call to love one another as I have loved you. This is not a table of stone command. It will never nor could ever be something like this. Now I have done it. Now I have attained it. Now I have reached it. Now we've got that out of the way. Now I'm past that. Give me something else to do. That never happens. This, this new commandment, this genius, is a unique fusion of being and doing, of being and living. As, as this comes in, it can pour out. As, as this is being received, it can be given. When this comes into me, it can go out to others. And it keeps on happening. It doesn't stop happening. It, it's like the sun that's up there 93 million miles from the earth. And the sun never says, I've done it now. I've accomplished it. I, I, I put this light out into the darkness. I put this light out into space. I put this light out to the earth. I've done it now. And I can... I can I can, I can turn off the switch. I, I've done it now. That's not the way this commandment works. This commandment is not necessarily do this and thou shalt live. Do this and do it right. Make, make sure you have it in the right order. Get it at the right time. Make, make sure that this thing is, uh, yes, yes, yes. You, uh, you carried out this regulation properly. This commandment is a way of life. This commandment, the second statement, cannot be given to the nation of Israel. It is not a territorial church law. It is not for the masses, but for a unique community of chosen saints. It can only be the voluntary choice of one who is born of God. No one else can experience it. No one else can practice it. No one else can live it. No one else can complete it. No one else can understand it. Though they might observe it, but they could not live it. Something very unique must happen before we can do this. It could not be seen, nor heard, nor known until it was revealed to us in the life of Christ. He said, as I have loved you. The new commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you which was never an option. It was never a possibility until Christ came and showed us how to do it. He fulfilled this first and greatest of all commandments. I'm going to slip back here to Matthew 22 and show you how Jesus said it in his own words. This is in verse 35. Matthew 22, 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, what, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These are powerful words. What wondrous love is this, O my soul. But I want to add one more thing. Our text says, which thing is true in him and in you. And this may not be very easy for us to believe. John wants us to believe it. He, John knows that until we believe what he said, not, nothing else is going to happen. It's true in him and in you. It was true in him, true in Christ, because Jesus was the truth. But I'm going to please pay attention to this next thought. It's, you can easily miss what I'm saying here. And you can't read what I'm saying, so you have to listen to it. Jesus Christ was not the truth because he taught the truth. 
nor was he the truth because he spoke the truth, because both Caiaphas and Pilate did that much. But Jesus was the truth because he was true. And when Malachi tells us in chapter 2 that the law of truth is in his mouth, referring to the prophet, referring to the priest, referring to your ministry team here in this congregation, referring to the one who takes the words of God and teaches them, referring to the person who's living what Christ taught him to live, that law of truth is this, that not only do we say the truth, but we ourselves are true, true in heart. We are true. Yet this most powerful of all commandments was not only true in him, it is true in us. What does that mean? It's true in us. It is not true about you. It is true in you. How does John know that? Because he says in that verse that we read this morning, this evening as we started, verse 8, I'll read it to you again so you get it. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. A new light. A new light. A true light begins to shine in my heart. And when that true light begins to shine in my heart, something is true in me that was never true before. I'm going to give you an illustration of this. It won't be easy for you to give this illustration, but I'm going to give it to keep you awake and give you an insight onto how this new commandment works. The true light must shine. I never had a good relationship with my father. I was embarrassed by him sometimes. I think I hated him at other times. I guess I thought he hated me. My father really did not ever teach me anything. I never really sat down and never had a conversation with my daddy. It was a very sad thing. And uh, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. So there wasn't a whole lot of light there. I certainly would never have said I love my father and I was sure he did not love me. So years went by, married, called the ministry, silence from the ministry. One of the most difficult things I ever experienced. It was on Saturday night. Phone rang. My wife answered the phone. I was at someplace else in the house. She said, Daddy, telephone. And that's not unusual. I get a phone call. So I went and got the, picked up the phone there. There were no cell phones in those days. And it was my daddy on the other end of the phone. And I think he probably called me two times in his lifetime. This was the, this was the last time he called me as far as I know. So he tried to talk a little bit, and I could tell he had nothing to say. And I, I was kind of irritated by it. I had other things to do. Tomorrow's Sunday morning. And he's on the phone there, and you really don't have much reason to be on there. And I was trying to figure out what this is all about, but I was trying to be polite. You know, I, though this relationship was not good, I, I was not obnoxious about it. And then finally he got around and said something like this. Dale, I thought we'd call you tonight. Uh, tonight is Saturday night. Well, I thought, well, that's, that's a brilliant deduction. You know, anyone that got a calendar knows that much. And then he said, tomorrow morning, Sunday morning. And now we're really gaining ground. We made it all the way from Saturday to Sunday. And then he said, I just thought I'd call you because I thought maybe Sundays might be a little bit hard for you. And I just wanted to call you. And then he was ready to hang up. And I resented that phone call. I felt he heard some things that I wish he wouldn't have heard. 
and I didn't know what to do with that call, and I didn't know how to process that. That thing worked on me, and I, w I was just frothing inside. I, I could hardly handle that. But one day, something happened. One day, the true light shone in my heart. And I saw my daddy like I'd never seen him in my life. And when this change came in my heart towards him, and he was not able to change towards me, he had Alzheimer's that bad that he didn't know, he, he didn't know his own wife, he didn't know his children. My, my, my attitude, my heart changed towards him completely. There was, a, there was a miracle happened there. I'm not going to go into that tonight. But I had a new daddy, and I saw him in a new light, and all of a sudden I thought of that phone call he made on that Saturday night, and all of a sudden I saw it all together differently, and the thing, was true that, the thing that was true in Christ was true in me. And I admired my dad tremendously. I loved him dearly. I thought of how hard it must have been for him to try to find words to say on the phone on a Saturday night. He didn't know any better way to say it. He tried as hard as he could to express something that was very difficult to say to a preacher that's no longer serving in the ministry, his own son. Until that light, light shone in my heart, I, there was no, there was, it was not true in me. Is it true in you? It was not true in me. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past. And the true light now is shining. I just like you think about something tonight. I like you think about somebody in this church that you can hardly stand. I would like you to think about somebody that you would not want to sit beside of in the church service and you wouldn't want to share the song book. I'd, I'd like you to think of somebody you would not want to be in their prayer group tonight before the service started. Is there somebody here that you look down on? You quickly see their faults. You, you would quickly... Give a smile and a bit of affirmation if somebody would say a little something nasty about this person. And you'd kind of agree with that real quick. And I'm going to tell you something. The true light is not shining. Would you, would you please accept that? There's something wrong with the true light. And it's still true in him, but it's not true in us. If that's where we are. It might be true in others, but it's not true in us. That's what John is saying here. Just like it was not true in me. Let me just take you a little further. May I do this tonight? This is not on my notes. It's just my heart tells me to say this. There's a brother or sister. There's a person in the community. There's someone here that you just cannot relate to. And you would rather not be involved and rather not have to bother yourself. So in my case there, I gave that example of my father. That, that was a relationship I had with. Can you imagine something? How do you, think, how do you think Dale related to his wife when that was his attitude towards his dad? And, and how do you think Dale related to his children when that was his attitude towards his daddy? And, and do all of you know the answer by now? It shouldn't be hard for you to figure that out. It was the same thing. The true light wasn't shining. It wasn't true in me. And there were abrasive relationships, and there were needs with others. And I was a very polite person. I was very sociable. I got along with people anywhere, but to a certain point. Should I take it one step further? I got along with people well, as long as I got some benefit out of it. I could be very polite to you if I could make a sale doing it. I got along very well with you. If you said something nice to your neighbor after our visit. Which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past. And the true light now shineth. Is this light that has come into the world. And here's the genius of the new commandment. It is a quality of love that the world has not seen before. As I have loved you is how we are to love one another. So I just want to answer, answer a couple of questions and we'll call that 
sufficient. This might take just a little bit of time here. What is the genius of love? And Christ is here speaking of agape love. I think you've heard of that term before. There are other words for love. There, the Greeks have several words for love. We just have one word for love in Spanish and only one word for love in English. But in Greek, there are at least three words for love. And these words are very different. I'm, I'm not going to take time tonight to explain the difference. This theme, as introduced in this text, then becomes the focus of the message in the book of John. Most of chapter 3 and chapter 4 are given to the subject of love. The first part of chapter 5, for John, love is the main thing. For John, love is the most important thing in the Christian life. For John, there's no higher attainment, and John Wesley as well, for John, until I've learned to love, I'm, there's darkness somewhere. Agape love is God's love. That is to say, it's how God loves. It gets no benefit out of loving. It loves without a reason for loving. It expects no reward for what it does. It needs no recognition. Such love is completely unselfish and seeks only the best of another. Do I get any benefit out of it or not? It is the first, it is the very first evidence of being a true disciple. If I'm back in First John right there, in chapter 3, we should take a look there at verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death, darkness. The, the, the darkness is not passed. The true light has not yet shined. It's not true in us. And, and the test here, the evidence here, that we are truly Christian people is that we have love for others. And he, he especially calls out here love to the brethren. He that loved not his brother or his father or his wife or his neighbor or his preacher, he that loveth not abideth in the death, not converted, not saved. And such love is the result of being first loved. Being first loved in this very way, that if I love God back or not, God doesn't change. Being loved like this, that though I resist it, do not accept it, feel like I don't need it, would better off without it, God still loves, because that's what agape love does. It's not a love that's reciprocal. It's not a love that pays back. It's not a love that, that uh, shares the benefits. Go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Here it is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. God took the initiative and sent his son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Look at verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. God did it first. That's the genius of this love. You know the love chapter, it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm just going to read a very few verses there. Described in this particular case, in these very unusual and beautiful words. Verse 4. Charity, that's love, suffereth long, that's agape love, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Charity is characterized in these two ways. Charity does nothing that should not be done. Yet in every case, it does the best thing that could be done. Charity never does anything that should not be done. But in every case, does that which should be done. I'm going to ask you something. Do you believe that that can be true in you? In me and in you? It says here that love is long-suffering. Charity suffers long. Love suffers. Love suffers long. Love suffers long. How long is that? From here to the back bench. 
How long is long? From here until 9 o'clock. How long is long? From here until Saturday. How long is long? Love suffers long. We had a son in our home that had expressed to his mother and I a struggle he was having with his own personal purity. And that boy's mother, when he went to bed at night, his mother would go in and sit on the floor beside his bed every night until she heard him sound asleep. Then she would quietly get up, step out of his room, and come out to where I was. How long did she do that? Love suffers long. Love accepts interruptions and inconvenience and does it long. Why does love do that? How long does love suffer? It does it as long as the other person needs it. As long as we can contribute, as long as we can help, as long as we can benefit that person, as long as we can make them better than what they, what they were, it keeps suffering, it keeps serving. It suffers long. Love is neither proud on one hand or jealous of others on the other hand. It readily sees good in others and is slow to believe the opposite. If someone would come to you and tell you that one of your preachers uh, was just found downtown doing this, that, and the next thing, and it was a very unwholesome thing and you heard this report what would you do about it would you believe it or not how many people would you tell about the thing the news the little juicy news you just heard before you would check it out to see if it's true or not if I cannot trust you tonight if I have no confidence in you Perhaps I can love you in the same way, same way that I would love an enemy, but I will not love you as I should love my brother. There's something wrong. This genius of love is illustrated in the golden rule, Matthew 7, 12. Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We find that same law, that same commandment, that same new commandment in the example of the good neighbor that you usually call the good Samaritan. Look how he's treated that person. That Samaritan never got a benefit out of that. He didn't get anything good out of it. Of course, the two fellows that went down the road ahead of time, they were not going to be disturbed. They were not going to have their time interrupted. They, they were not about to be bothered. It was not true in them. The true light was not shining. But that good Samaritan, you see what he did there. That's love. It holds out its hand to give, but is not holding it out to receive. Though it will, it will permit others to love, to share, to provide, and even to correct oneself. But it's necessary to see it rather than hearing about it. You really only learn about love when you experience it and see it. Talking about it like I'm doing tonight is a poor substitute for having that light truly shine in the heart. How did Christ reveal the genius of true love? And you probably have heard by now that I like the definition of true love, disinterested benevolence, the good that we do to others for which I expect no benefit personally. How did Christ reveal this new commandment, the genius of this new commandment, this true love. Everything that Christ did was in harmony with his Father's will. Everything he did was under the anointing of the Spirit. Everything that he did was empowered by love. His was the Spirit of love. From him came deeds of love. And out of his mouth came words of love, all perfectly portrayed in wisdom and compassion. I'll give you a couple of examples. We see the love of Christ, the love of God revealed in Christ, the true light shining 
as we see him winning an alien life. That is, here's a person that is, would be rejected by society, would be looked at as an outcast, an impossible case. Here's one that no one else would, try to, would, would attempt to work on. Here, here's a situation that is beyond hope, and so we're not going to waste our time here. But, but Jesus is different. We find this story in John 4. You call it the story of the woman at the well. Jesus made rapid progress with this unlikely visitor to the well at Sychar. She thought him first to be a Jewish man. She called him that in verse 9. And then, as her respect began to grow for him, in verse 11 she called him, Sir. And still later, she understood him to be a prophet. That's down to verse 19 by now. And at last, she looked at him and recognized him to be the Messiah. That's in verse 29. How did Jesus win her? What did he do to change her thinking? What did he do to open this door, to open her heart, so that the light could shine in there? He wanted to put water in there, but that's light. It's truth coming to this woman's heart. How did it get in there? He allowed her to serve him. Lady, I'm, I'm sorry, but I was traveling, and I see you have a pitcher of water there. I don't have any. Could you give me a drink? And then he offered to her something that she really needed, but she didn't know she needed it. She thought she needed that water in that well, but she needed something else, but she didn't know about it. And he told her that if you would know who this is that's talking to you, you would have asked him and he would have given you something that you do not have, ma'am. You, you need living water. That's what, that's what he would give you. And when she at last asked for it, yeah, I'd like to have that. I would have to come here and draw water then. She said, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Do you have a way to give it to me? So Jesus told her to go bring your husband. And, and she wasn't able to do that. And G Jesus gave her credit for telling the truth about that. Jesus had found a weak spot in her life, a great need in her life. But he did not reject her for it nor condemn her for it. And when he gave this in, in, unique insight into her life, and she became aware that he knew about this, and yet was still right there talking with her, this is the same man I gave water to, this is the same person that's respecting me, she asked him a question about worship. And it's perhaps the deepest teaching on worship found any place in the New Testament, what Jesus said to her about the Father seeking, seeking such to worship him who do that in spirit and in truth. So Jesus respectfully answered her question. And now the full re revelation comes to this lady at the well when he says to her, I that speak unto thee am he. And he did no miracle for this woman, but he loved her. And she knew she was being loved. You see, my dear people tonight, you don't need to try to love your husband. You don't need to try to love your daughter. You don't need to try to love someone who is maybe unlovely to others. You don't need to try to do it. If, if you love them, that you cannot hide it. If you love them, they will know it. If you love them, it will come out. If you love them, the light will shine. If you, if you love them, they will sense it. Depends what condition they are in. They might reject that love at least for a while. I know I did. My wife tried to love me for 27 years, and she wasn't able to do it because I wouldn't allow her to do it. I didn't know that I didn't allow it. I didn't know I was causing a problem. I didn't know I was resisting her kindness. I didn't know that I was turning aside her efforts to do some little favor, to do some, give me some, meet some little need in my life. Yeah, but I was so, I was completely capable of doing it without her help. She needed me, but I didn't need her. And so that's the way life was. And she tried hard to love. And many times she went to bed crying at night. She had tried, but she couldn't do it. And there are people like that. But not everyone is. 
And some people, when you love them, they feel it. They feel it right away. They feel it at the very beginning. They, they are blessed with it. It's a genius. It's the only true indication. It's the most important evidence that someone's a child of God. I think of Jesus' relationship with Peter. I think of the first and second call of Peter. I think of Jesus calling him Peter once and then calling him again. I think of that crowd that had gathered along the side of the lake. I think of how he was pressed down towards the water's edge. But there were some fishermen out there, and they were working early that morning on their nets. And Jesus asked one of these fishermen if he could borrow their boat. And it was Peter who kind of got him into his little vessel there. And, and Jesus asked him if he would just pull off from the shore a little bit so that he could see that crowd a little bit better. And Peter's back here at the stern, and he's taking care of the tackling and holding his boat just in the right position so Jesus can face this crowd. And Jesus is speaking to these people up here, but Jesus' heart is turned towards this man back here in his boat. How did Peter feel in this staged event? Being responsible to hold this boat just in a very steady position. Yes, Jesus taught the people, but his goal was the man at the back. And he says to him when it's all done, why don't you uh, try your net, see how this works. No, no, sir, no, 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 we tried it all night, no use. Well, since you suggested it, I'll try it. At thy word, I'll let down the net. You know, there's a lot of power in the words we use, the words we say to other people. And now there's a multitude of fish, and now Peter falls down and says, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. But Jesus says something different. Peter, follow me. And now three and a half years later, three and a half years have passed by. Peter talks too much. He talks very unwisely. Peter prayed for, Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith would fail not. Jesus loved this unpromising disciple. Here he is asleep in the garden. And now a cock crows twice. And then there's bitter weeping. And then we hear these words. I go fishing. And another, another draught of fish. And then some words come from the shore. Come and dine. And then, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And then a personal, personal commission was given to this unfaithful man. And confidence was invested in one who had seriously failed. And then twice more, Jesus said these words to Peter. Follow me. Follow me. Let me ask you something tonight. Did you ever hear the day of Pentecost? 53, years, 53 days after he denied Christ three times at the high priest's house over an open fire, 3,000 souls were converted because he preached this same man. The genius of the new commandment. If I would find an erring brother in the church, an erring sister, a young, a youth, a youth girl in this congregation that's kind of suffering, not doing so well, you see her kind of drifting, you see her kind of playing with the marginal fringes of the congregational position, you see her kind of hanging off to the edge. But some tender love comes by and some light shines in her heart. Someone takes some sincere interest in her and someone sees perfect potential there and someone sees a lot of usefulness for the future of Christ and his kingdom in that young lady. And others only see the hair doing the sleeve light, but someone sees more than that. Someone talks to that young lady with those words of love, with that kindness, with that broken heart. Someone shares some words of encouragement to her. And a soul that otherwise could have been lost finds hope to try again. I just need to share that with you tonight. See this man that receiveth sinners and eateth with them. A friend of publicans and sinners. Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. 
And some mocked, but the tax collector did not. This day of salvation come to this house. Jesus loved people into heaven. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So he leaves the 99 and seeks the lost one. But where is the lost one? Where did he go? Where do we go to find him? Listen, I will rise and go to my father. This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. And his enemies look on and they said, Behold, the world is going after him. Well, why not? Never man loved like this love, this man loved. And here's one born blind, then healed on the Sabbath day. And because of his testimony, he was cast out of the synagogue. And Jesus went out and found him. He that cometh to me, I will know why he's cast out. And the children sang Hosanna. And the local fraternity of publicans invited him to a meal. And sinners drew near for to hear him. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus love Judas? Does Jesus love you? To every man a chance, and to the rest of us a second chance. Let it alone this year also, till I shall have dunged about it and dig, dig about it and dung it. And having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. This is the genius of his love. The genius of the new commandment. You and I will probably never attain it in this life. But these thoughts walking, going through our minds and I should stir us. They should invite us. They should encourage us. They should stimulate us. They should cause us to aspire. To look for ways to love others. It's easy to love a person that does you good, that makes you look important. It's easy to love a person that says noble things about you and makes you feel like you're worthy and Easy to love someone that gives you an advantage, makes you shine. It's easy in the church to look down on the one that makes me look bad. It's easy in the family. To uh, a Mahian attitude to put off to the side the child in the home that is not doing so well and people notice it. It's easy to talk about the children we have that are successful or doing well that are. I'll just tell you this this is just. Maybe it won't make any sense to you. you. You people live out here in Missouri. You were not very acquainted with the charity movement. But I, I helped to start that back in 1982, and we worked with that for the first six, eight, seven so years of its practice. We started new churches and new places. And as time went on then, we, we left that movement and we went into a more conservative, more traditional, more established kind of church. My wife and I did, our children. And I come back here to the States to preach and so I'm preaching at a stately Mennonite church, a stately conservative beachy church where things are really in order, you know, and all the men have plain coats on, the ladies all have their ties on their coverings. Back here in the back, a couple comes in, a family comes in, about six or eight children, and he's got a great big beard. He's got a plaid check shirt on. She has a, kind of a white flowing veil thing there with some kind of a jumper, and they're all excited. They come in, and they came to hear Dale preach tonight. And there's a charity church about 20 miles over there to the east, and they thought they'll come over the night for the service. They heard about it. Now the service is over, now we're dismissed, and now we're going back through this aisle here, and the plain coat over here, and the covering ribbons over here, and the black stockings and shoes, and we go back through, and we 
greeting everybody, and, and then we get to this motley goes on, and Dale, there's a genius to the new covenant. Brother Shulman, no. What are you going to do when you get there, Dale? What would you have done, Murray? Oh, Brother Dale, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love them. Let them put their hand on your shoulder. I made up my mind that I will never turn one of those away. I made up my mind that if Christ was here, he would offer them a chance, they would offer him hope, offer them some kind of encouragement, offer them some kind of acceptance. I made up my mind that I'll do the same. I got in a lot of trouble doing that. But tonight I have no regrets. I haven't always done that as well as I should have. I wasn't able to do that until after 27 years of marriage. It was after God did some things in here, after the light sh shone in here like God wanted it to shine. It was not true in me. It was true in him all the while, but it was not true in me. And I'm asking you tonight, is it true in you? This greater love is at the same time a costly love. It is costly to love the brotherhood, as Peter tells us to do it in his letter. It is costly to lay down our lives for the brethren, as John teaches us to do in chapter 3. It is costly to forgive. It is costly to go the second mile, as the school children heard this week. It is costly to bless those who curse us. Costly to love the people that rob our cattle. It is costly to give to another what we thought we surely needed for ourselves. It is costly to look at the needs of others and put aside our own. It is costly to go to a brother and tell him his fault between you and him alone. It costs nearly nothing to tell everybody else about his faults, but to go to him alone and say it is costly. And it's more costly yet to go a second time like Jesus taught us to do if the first time didn't take care of it. It is costly to dismiss a member who will not hear the church, will not hear the brotherhood. Yet it is more costly yet to go and seek for him after he was excommunicated. Love can do that. Christ did that. We will do that. If it's true in us, as it was true in him, we'll go and find them and bring them back. I pursued one excommunicated person from our congregation for 15 years. I would go to the job site where he'd be working. I'd try to find him at his house. Sometimes I could find him where I went to look, and sometimes he wasn't there, and maybe he was there sometimes and would not come to the door. But I tried for 15 years. And one day he, I got a phone call, and his man called me and said, Dale, would you come? And he had told me where he is. He had been living with other women. He was spending his money on drink. Another child was born that was not with his wife. His life was as low down as it could go. And in that low state, he called me, Dale, could you come? He was with us in the church service that next Sunday. And I invited him to the front to share some words with the congregation. He stood there and he tried to think of something to say and couldn't quite say it. He tried to put some words together, but nothing really came out. I gave him some time to see if he could get his thoughts together. He didn't seem like he could make any kind of confession, didn't seem like he had anything to say, and so I stopped him and I said, Julio, I want you to look back there. And back there, one of the back benches, his wife was sitting, 
and she had been hurt so badly. She had been so offended, so affected by this man's awful life. It cost her tremendous, and she was sitting back there watching her husband. I said, Julio, look back there. What do you see? And those who said that, then you thought I shot him with a, with a 308. He fell right down on his knee, just fell down like, like he was shot. And fell right over that, that bench and started weeping and wailing out loud. I told his wife to confront and he was on him. And light began to shine in that man's heart. And the darkness has passed. And the true light now shineth. And the thing which is true in him became true in Julio that day, that morning, in that church service. It was renewed in his wife. It became true in him. He was not the same after that. It's one thing to excommunicate somebody from the church. It's another thing to go after them until they come back. It's costly. It's costly to go help a brother put up a building, a chicken house. When you want one like that for yourself. It's costly to rejoice with one who's rejoicing when he receives something that you greatly needed yourself. It's not easy to weep with those who weep when it was their own wrong choices that led to their sorrow. And just how do we feel about the family and the congregation that is a wayward son or a daughter? It is costly to intercede in prayer. I was in Alberta last week. The meetings were over. It was Sunday night. A precious man, father, husband in that church, met me at the back of the center aisle. He said, Brother Dale, you're, you're going to leave us. But I have a lost brother. Would you write down his name? Would you promise me to pray for my brother? I don't know how we can get my brother back. But we must pray for my brother. Interceding for people is a costly experience. Praying for lost souls is a costly and time-consuming thing. It's costly to intercede in prayer when after 25 years, there seems to be no noticeable change in the person for whom we prayed for all that time. I must end tonight, but do I know the genius of the new covenant, the new commandment? Do I love others as God loved me? Or have I always done so well that I, that I don't need love? Am I so capable that I can handle it by myself? Do I know how to love as Christ did? How can I learn to love? Will you tonight... Will we tonight allow others and give others the opportunity to love us so that you can go and minister grace and kindness to others because you've received it so you can give it. You were humble enough to benefit from it when somebody tried. Am I in this church because all the rest need me or do I feel my great need of the others? Dear Savior, teach us how to love. I will tell you this story of God's love to me. And then we'll leave it for the night. So we were starting this charity movement, and we believed in preaching. We, we put our emphasis on preaching. We, we drew large crowds because of the kind of preaching that was done there, and and usually the large auditoriums that we had were filled with people any time at a service. We brought two men over from Russia to speak to us in these large assemblies that were gathered together. We had planned a week of services in the evenings. And on that first evening, they asked me to preach first. I'm not going to tell you the title of the message. I'm not going to tell you what happened, but... 
I put everything into that sermon that I could, and I, I thought, surely this, this sermon would be well accepted. And that was over then, and the next morning came, and someone got a hold of me and said, Dale, uh, those two brothers from Russia were very offended by your preaching last night. And they told me. They didn't understand a word you said because you preached English and they don't speak that language. But your spirit was wrong. And they told us that they want to get on the plane and go back across the ocean and go back home because they cannot be in a meeting where something is as far out of order as what that service was last night. And if that preacher is going to be continuing to moderate these services to be a part of it, they, they cannot stay here. That They need to leave. And I heard that. It was the next morning. It was Tuesday morning. I told my wife about it. I said, I don't know what to do. She said, Dale, don't be offended by their words. She said, sit down with them and ask them what was wrong. And tell them that you'd be glad for their instruction. You'd be glad for them to help you. Tell them that if they have any words of advice, they should share with you what they observed. Tell them that you're interested in how they feel. Tell them that their criticisms are welcome. Tell them you want to learn from their spiritual growth and from their years of suffering, for their, for their years in prison. You want to learn from them. That was not my nature. I didn't want to do that. But I did that. And these two stately gentlemen sat down and did what they could to help. We turned into tremendous friends. We finished that week together with great blessing of God upon us. And then, as they were ready to leave and go back home, something dawned on me that I had not thought about. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I thought these words, I thought, for God so loved Dale that he went over to Russia and found two preachers that were seriously persecuted for their faith, spent years and years in prison, suffered greatly, called into the offices of the KJB several times. And God so loved Dale that he brought those men out of Russia and put them into West Germany. And there, through a strange set of circumstances and communications, over in America, someone learned about these two men. They put them on an airplane and brought them to America. And God so loved Dale that we met together in the same location. And they heard a sermon that should not have been preached the way it was. And God so loved Dale, they did something about it. God so loved Dale, he moved events and moved history and moved locations and moved in families and moved in police forces and moved in immigrations to improve the quality of a man. They needed the light to shine so they could be true in him as it was true in Christ. So it could be true in me like it was true in those two men. True in me like it was true in Johann Tuevs and in Gerhard Hamm. It was true in them. I could see it. I could feel it. I knew it was true in them. But God knew. It was not true in me. This is the genius of the new commandment. And I hunger for that. And I yearn for it. I long for it. The congregation here needs it. We all do. We need to help each other to find it. We need to be patient with each other until the other one gets there. We don't all travel at the same rate. We don't all see it at the same time. Some of us who have pursued the Christian life make a serious mistake. We think that because we see it, others should see it as soon as we do. And then we think we don't need the one 
that can't do it as well as we have learned to do it, that hasn't seen it the way we have seen it. And so we think we need to find another place to go to church where everyone's on the same upper level where I am and forget that someone helped me when I didn't do it right. And that's an opportunity to help somebody else. That's the genius of the new commandment. May God bless you and Brother Mary, you may close that service.